Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, and welcome to the reading of lesson number 11 in the series of Sabbath School lessons on the Gospel of John. This is lesson number 11. It's titled The Father, the Son and the Spirit and is ready for teaching on December 14. And I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, December 7. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we study this interesting and important lesson this week, as we look at the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and your interactions and your interface with us, Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will make the words that we read this week come alive. May your Bible, may your word that has been written for us shine and may we come to know more about you, but also give ourselves to you. And today I'd particularly like to pray for those recovering from Hurricane Beryl in the Caribbean that devastated Jamaica and many other countries, including some states in the United States, and also for those who are affected by the major typhoon that went through the Philippines and into Southeast Asia. Lord, wherever people are, we just pray that you'll not only protect them, but give them hope for the future. And for Joe Pert and Pompilio and Josiah. And Lord, I'd also like to pray for Valdo Gongalves of Santo Antonio in Brazil and Fernando de Jesus and Sarah from Virginia and Lady Vanessa in the United States who listen each week. Lord, I just pray that each of them, but also each of us who are listening, we all have our needs. I pray that we may rejoice in the fact that Jesus came and lived and died, that each of us could have eternal life. And as we learn more about this, that this week, we pray that we will all be blessed in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 14 and verse 26. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Let's read that again, John 14, verse 26. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The Gospel of John is a mosaic of themes. John calls upon signs or miracles to show that Jesus is the Messiah promised by the prophets. John uses an array of witnesses to proclaim Jesus as the Christ. He also uses the I am statements to point to his divinity. All three members of the Godhead are mentioned in John chapter 1. Let's refresh that again. John 1 verses 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of of all mankind. And still in chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. And verses 32 to 34. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen... And I testify that this is God's chosen one. For centuries, humans have tried fully to understand the nature of the Godhead. But because we can't, many reject the idea. How foolish, though, to reject something just because we can't fully understand it. 
or because it doesn't fit within the narrow limits of human reasoning. John says that if you want to understand God, you must look at Jesus and what has been revealed in the Word. This approach opens to us a whole new world of relationships. Among the three members of the Godhead, between the members of the Godhead and humans, and among humans themselves. This week's lesson looks at how the Gospel of John presents the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, but now within the context of the farewell discourse of John chapter 13 through to chapter 17. Sunday, December 8, The Heavenly Father The Gospel of John is written from the standpoint of the overall biblical narrative, beginning with our origins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1, or, in the beginning, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit created the heavens and the earth. They are the source of all that exists. They created the universe, including the beings who inhabit it. On our planet, there was a special creation of life, and the most special of that creation was humanity. And God's purpose for creating humanity was that we should live in loving harmony with Him and with one another. Unfortunately, Lucifer brought sin into this world. Sin is, among other things, a disruption of our relationship with God. It misrepresents who God is. Thus, Jesus took upon himself our human nature in order to restore knowledge of God and to bring salvation to humanity. While here, Jesus submitted his life to the Father, living according to his guidance. He said, I and my Father are one, in John 10.30. The Father is in me, and I in him, in John 10.38. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me, in John 10, verse 37. What are some of the roles of the Father as described in the following passages? First of all, John 3, verses 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And chapter 6, verse 57, Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. And John 5, verse 22, Moreover, The Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. And chapter 5, verse 30, By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. And John chapter 6, verse 32, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. And John 14, verse 10, Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And verse 24 of John 14, Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And John 6 verse 45, It is written in the prophets, They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. And John 15, verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And finally, John 16, verse 23, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you Whatever you ask in my name. 
And so to finish today, these verses present the Father in close connection with Jesus Christ, His Son. The Father has intimate contact with our world and a deep investment in our salvation. What does this truth teach us about God's love for us? Monday, December 9, Jesus and the Father We were created by the Godhead for a personal relationship with them. We read in Genesis 1, 26 to 27, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. Yet, because of sin, that relationship was radically disrupted. We can see the immediate impact of this disruption in the Garden of Eden story. Read Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. How does this reveal the breach that sin caused, and what does it mean that it was God seeking them out, not vice versa? Genesis 3, beginning at verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? The intention of the Godhead was to offer healing to all humanity for that breach caused by sin, even if all humanity would not accept what they offered. To accomplish the restoration of this relationship, one member of the Godhead became human. Thus, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, manifesting the glory of God, as we read in John 1, verses 14 to 18. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. As a result, humanity has received his fullness and grace. This is what Jesus came to share, to declare the glory of God so that the relationship broken by sin might be restored, at least to all who were willing to accept by faith what has been offered them in Christ Jesus. What wonderful hope is seen for us in these texts? And the text we'll look at are, first of all, John 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And John 5, verses 16 to 18. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And John 6, verse 69, We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And John 10, 10, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And John 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. 
And John 20, verse 28, Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 530, In Christ is life original, unborrowed, underived. End of quote. Yet, as the incarnate Son, who had emptied himself, as it says in Philippians 2 7, of the exercise of his prerogatives, Christ, speaking on his existence on earth as a man among men, could refer to his possession of life as a gift from God. Ellen White continues on the same page The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. End of quote. God was not recognized by humanity, we read in John 17 and verse 25. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. Thus, he sent his only Son, as you read in John 9 verse 4, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And John 16, verse 5. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Thus he sent his only son, in order that he, the Father, might be known. And so to finish today, in the context of the cosmos, an atheist wrote, In our obscurity... In all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. What does the Bible teach, which shows just how wrong this man is? Tuesday, December 10. Knowing the Son is knowing the Father. Throughout the Gospel of John, the Apostle describes how Jesus, the Son, does activities that point to the Father. Jesus explains who the Father is and shows what his relationship to our world is. This is all in keeping with John 1.18, which says that he makes the Father known. The Greek is exegeomai, to explain, interpret, exposit. Let's read John 1.18. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Again and again, Jesus does this. The word Father, Pater, P-A-T-E-R, appears 136 times in John, and 18 times in 1 John, 2 John and 3 John, more than one-third of the entire uses in the New Testament. The farewell discourse is one of the prime locations in the Gospel where Jesus makes the Father known. Jesus was the Father's representative on earth, and he came to live out in human flesh the Father's will. In fact, Jesus said that in all things he sought to do the Father's will and not his own, as we read in John 5.30. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. This may seem at first a startling statement but it shows how totally surrendered Jesus, as a human being, was to the Father. Jesus said, too, that he had been sent by the Father to finish his work, the salvation of humanity, and that the Father himself bore witness to his work in John 5, verses 36 to 38. I have testimony weightier than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to finish— the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me, and the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. Jesus proclaimed 
that the Father sent him to serve as the only one through whom humanity may come to the Father. John 6 verse 40, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. And John 6.44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. The Father wants people to have the eternal life found in Jesus, who promises to raise them up in the resurrection. What do the following texts teach us about the relationship between Jesus and the Father. John 7 verse 16, Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own, it comes from the one who sent me. John eight thirty eight. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you were doing what you have heard from your Father. And John 14 verse 10, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And John 14 verse 23, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. And John 15 verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener, and verses 9 and 10, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and remain in his love. And John 16, verses 27 and 28, No, the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. And John 17 verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus' claims about his relationship to the Father are astonishing. He asserts that all of his teachings are the teachings of the Father, that all he says he had personally heard from the Father, that belief in him is the same as belief in the Father, that both his very words and his works are all of the Father, and that he and the Father are united in loving and working for the salvation of humanity. What a powerful testimony to the closeness of Jesus to his Father in heaven. And so to finish the day, how would your life be changed if your thoughts and actions were fully an expression of God's will for your life? That is, how can we better live out what we know from Jesus is God's will for our lives? Wednesday, December 11, The Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is not as prominent in the Gospel of John as the Father and the Son are, yet his role is crucial to the success of Jesus' mission. Read John chapter 1, verses 10 to 13. What does this text teach us about the importance of the Holy Spirit for conversion? John 1, beginning at verse 10. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. In the first chapter of John, we can see just how central the role of the Holy Spirit is. John tells us that as many as received the word, that is, as many as believed in him, became the children of God, those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, John 1.13. This comes only from the work of the Holy Spirit. What do the following passages tell of the activities 
of the Holy Spirit. First of all, John 3, verses 5 to 8. And that reads, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And John 6, verse 63, The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. And John fourteen twenty six. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And John fifteen twenty six. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And John 16, verses 7 to 11. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the Prince of this world now stands condemned. In describing to his disciples, Ellen White writes in Desire of Ages, page 671, the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided for his church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent, and without this the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. End of quote. What a blessing, then, to receive the Holy Spirit, who certifies that God is true, as you read in John 3.33. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. It is the Spirit that convicts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, as we read in John 16, 8 to 11. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the Prince of this world now stands condemned. Hence the key for us to know what is right, what is true, and what is good is our submission of our reason and life experiences to the Word of God through the convicting and convincing power of the Holy Spirit. Thursday, December 12, The Prayer of Jesus John chapter 17 is sometimes called the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus. It concludes the farewell discourse. Jesus came to this earth so that humanity might be restored ultimately to its original personal relationship with God. He faithfully performed the signs that God gave him to do. In words and acts, he communicated God to the people. Jesus would soon be leaving this earth. He desired to share once again his love for his disciples. He wanted them to understand the close relationship between himself, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. 
and he wanted to bring them into the same personal relationship with God, the Father and the Spirit that he himself had. Read John chapter 17 verses 1 through to 26. What words or phrases in this chapter express the desire of Jesus for a close relationship to love between himself, the Father, and his disciples? John chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that Scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Many read John 17 to mean that the only thing that matters is unity and love. No question, God's purpose is to restore us to personal relationship with Him and with all people. But a more careful reading suggests a more vital connection between love and truth. In verse 3, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, not God, whomever we think he is. 
and in verse 6 and 8, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me, and they have kept your word, and know in truth that I came from you. And verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Christ came to reveal the Father. This revelation was important because of the many misconceptions about God. The Gospel of John shows how seriously Jesus took this mission. He rightly represents God's words and actions. If truth did not matter, why go to such lengths? Jesus lived a life of great difficulty, ultimately to be rejected by the religious authorities. He suffered indifference from the people, and even at times from his own disciples. One of his disciples betrayed him, and another denied him three times. He went through an unremitting trial and died on a cross at the hands of the very ones he came to save. And so, to finish the day, how can you better reflect the love of God, such as exists between Jesus and the Father, in your own life? Friday, December 13. Further thought. In assessing who Jesus is, his opponents judged by human standards, according to the flesh, as you read in John 8.15. You judge by human standards, I pass judgment on no one. This is probably even worse than judging by mere appearances, as is recorded in John 7.24. Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Here they resorted to the criteria of the flesh, of fallen humanity in a fallen world, without the compelling control of the Spirit. As you read in John 3, verses 3 to 7, Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. They saw his flesh, as it were, but never contemplated the possibility that he could be the Word made flesh, as we read in John 1.14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. To regard Christ by such limited criteria is to weigh him from a worldly point of view, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.16. So, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 671, The Comforter is called the Spirit of Truth. His work is to define and maintain the truth. He first dwells in the heart as the spirit of truth, and thus he becomes the comforter. There is comfort and peace in the truth, but no real peace or comfort can be found in falsehood. It is through false theories and traditions that Satan gains his power over the mind. By directing men to false standards, he misshapes the character. Through the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit speaks to the mind and impresses truth upon the heart. Thus, he exposes error and expels it from the soul. It is by the Spirit of truth, working through the Word of God, that Christ subdues his chosen people to himself. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, eternal life is to know God, as you read in John seventeen three. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What does it mean to know God as opposed to merely knowing certain facts about him. That is, that he is mighty or loving or a God of justice. 
If someone were to ask you, do you know God, what would you say? How does Jesus fit in with your answer? Question 2. In practical everyday terms, what is implied by Jesus' words, Thy word is truth, in John 17, 17. And question 3. Jesus prayed, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one, in John 17, verse 15. How do our own choices impact how well this prayer can be answered in our own lives? And reading our inside story, our mission story for this week is Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. A Dream in Dallas by Andrew McChesney Samuel declared that he had no interest in Bible studies. But you marked that you were interested on a Bible study insert card, said the caller. A Bible worker from the Dallas First Seventh Adventist Church in the U.S., state of Texas. He and other Bible workers were following up on cards distributed by the church. Well, I'm not interested, Samuel said. The caller placed the Bible study interest card aside. A week later, another Bible worker called Samuel. I'm not interested, Samuel said. The next week, the Bible worker called again. How much will the Bible studies cost? Samuel asked. Nothing. At the first Bible study, Samuel said he and his wife had been looking for a church. Their son had invited them to his church, but they had been offended by a sermon about the Pope and the Seventh-day Sabbath. I'll never set foot inside a Seventh-day Adventist church again, Samuel said. The Bible worker prayed silently and continued the Bible study. After several weeks, the Bible worker invited Samuel to evangelistic meetings at the Dallas First Seventh-day Adventist Church. He wondered what Samuel would say. Samuel agreed to go. At the first meeting, Samuel looked around the church with great interest. The building had a unique architecture, with a rounded sanctuary, a rounded ceiling, and pews curved around the platform. Samuel sought out the Bible worker. I need to talk to you, he said. The Bible worker was helping to prepare for the meeting and he asked Samuel if he could wait. Samuel agreed and sat down. He listened attentively to the evangelist's sermon about Daniel 2. Afterward, he found the Bible worker and blurted out, I want to be baptised. The Bible worker was shocked and exclaimed, What? Samuel said he had a dream 18 years earlier. In the dream, Jesus led me to a church and said, This is my church, he said. When I walked into the church this evening, I recognised it immediately. Finally, I found the church from my dream. I want to be baptised. The Bible worker took Samuel to the evangelist, who was equally surprised to hear about the dream. What made the story even more remarkable was that the church had burnt down and a new building had been constructed 13 years earlier. Samuel had seen the new church in his dream five years before it was constructed. Everything is possible when we cooperate with God in his mission, said the evangelist Slavik Ostapenko, now pastor of the Spokane Slavic Seventh-day Adventist Church in Washington State. These stories are provided by the General Conference Office of Adventist Mission, which uses Sabbath school mission offerings to spread the gospel worldwide. Read new stories daily at adventistmission.org. Remember, God is always faithful.